Hi, my name is Jesse Thornson. I am a pedestrian and bicycle planner for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. I planned and program and designed for people walking and biking along our trunk highway system within our right of way. Today, I'm going to talk about some use cases for the bike and ped data found within the Streetlight Insight platform. One of the use cases I wanted to talk about in this presentation is the planning for the 494 bridge detour. It's going to be a two year project. One year of that project, the bike and walk path alongside the bridge is going to be closed. And so we wanted to understand how are we going to detour bicyclists and pedestrians while that path is closed. So we have the Mendota Bridge to the north and the Old Cedar Bridge to the south. I really want to understand, you know, what distance considerations should there be? What um, should we consider, you know, for people who are using the bridge? Do they share common origins and destinations with people using other bridges? And so we use the Streetlight platform to understand what some of those similarities may be. So this particular slide highlights how we sort of developed the analysis within the Streetlight platform. We ended up using an origin destination through middle filters analysis. And for day types, we just did all, all days. We um, set up the destination census tracks and selected those in the traffic behavior. We looked at what the origin county was. In this instance, it was Hennepin County looked at the bridge that was being traveled upon as the middle filter. So for here is a 494 bridge. And then for the destination census tracts, we took the census tracts that were closest to the county that we're coming from and set those up as the destination zones. So we did it from Hennepin coming into Dakota County and Dakota County going into Hennepin County. Looking at the origins of Dakota County to the destinations of Hennepin County census tracts, using the Streetlight Insight platform, we were able to look at where people using the 494 bridge were traveling, where people using the Mendota bridge were traveling, and where people using the Old Cedar Road bridge were traveling. Comparing the three graphics that were um, output from there, we were able to see that the census tracks that were highlighted in the 494 bridge um, travel pattern were very similar to the ones where people were using the Mendota bridge. Flipping that analysis around and looking at people coming from Hennepin County and then going into Dakota County, you can see 494 bridge output is right here. The Mendota bridge output is right here and the Old Cedar bridge output is right here. And again, it was looking like the travel patterns for people using the 494 bridge are somewhat similar to the travel patterns for people using the Mendota bridge. The next use case where I wanted to highlight where we use the streetlight bike and pet index data is when we were in the development of our pet and bike crash risk tool. This tool is a proactive system-wide pedestrian and bicyclist crash risk analysis of Minnesota trunk highway network intersections within the Twin Cities metro area. Particularly, we use the streetlight pet and bike index data to understand the crash risk associated with pet and bike activity, and also to kind of help distinguish the exposure to pet and bike crashes from the other intersection characteristics that we're trying to analyze. To get that index data, we set up a simple zone activity analysis within the Streetlight Insight platform. We analyzed 2019 data just to get pre-COVID data because COVID obviously um, transformed a lot of our travel patterns. And so we wanted to see what they were before that. Day types, we wanted we selected all days, weekends, week, weekdays, we selected all parts of the day, and then the output was um, pedestrian index. And then we also did the same thing for the bike index. So we were able to get the bike and pedestrian index for each of these intersections on the trunk highway network within the metro area. So this is a list of the intersection characteristics that we wanted to evaluate for the crash risk analysis. We were somewhat limited by the uh, data that we had available to us. But you can see in here, we still are able to um, evaluate 23 different characteristics, some of which included the pet pedestrian index, the bike index, the pet and bike index, other things such as if there was a transit stop present, the intersection type, the number of through lanes, uh, the vehicle ADT were some of the characteristics that we wanted to evaluate for this particular analysis. To give you a little bit of a description of the risk data that we are looking at, we wanted to figure out 
Is it a risk factor? Is it a possible risk factor? And so looking at this particular table, you can kind of see that um, we have the percent of all crashes that were at that particular category for intersections. So this one in particular is transit stops. And then we looked at the percent of intersections um, in our metro that have that characteristic. And then we looked at what the percent of the non-motorized activity was from our metro at that particular intersection. So we had the indices for every single intersection. We added them all together, and then we figured out what percent of non-motorized activity was at that particular type of intersection. And so having kind of these three different types of metrics, we were able to look at first off is what our main determining factor was is is there an overrepresentation of pet and bike related crashes at this type of intersection and so in this particular instance you could see that the percent of crashes at intersections that um, had transit stops with 59 percent so 59 percent of all the crashes in the metro for pet and bike related activity at intersections were at intersections that had transit stops comparing that to the um, amount of intersections in our metro that have transit stops is 20.6%. So it's a 38, which in this sense is really large, it's a 38% difference between the crashes that are happening at those types of intersections and then the percent of those intersections. We were also able to compare what the difference was between the amount of non-motorized activity from the metro compared to the number of crashes that were happening and we could still see that there was about a 10% overrepresentation. So the, the, the street like bike and pet activity did help us understand that the increase in crashes was partly due to the fact that there were more pedestrians and cyclists present at those intersections, but there was still an overrepresentation in this particular instance. So for the street light index for pet activity and bike activity, what we really ended up doing was converting that relative number, index number that we got from Streetlight, we converted that into a percent rank number. So for instance, if the index was a 500 and in, within our metro, we have intersections that range from 500 to 20 for an index. Let's say if that um, particular intersection had a 500, it would be in the top 1% of intersections for activity in the metro. So you can kind of see on this graph here where uh, towards uh, the, the horizontal axis here is the index rank for intersections. And over here is the magnitude difference in, in crashes for those intersections. And so those intersections, that were in the top 10% or so of uh, intersections for pedestrian activity, they also were with, um, had a higher chance of pedestrian related crashes at them. And then we did the same thing for the bike index where we ended up getting the bike index for all the intersections. And we were able to see that somewhat similar to the pet index um, findings that the top 10% of intersections where there's um, more bike activity, that's where we have seen the most recorded crashes happening in the past. One thing that we ended up doing is we actually ended up combining the pedestrian index and the bike index output from Streetlight. We combined them together, and then we also combined the pet and bike crashes together. And then once we were to compare those two things together for each intersection, we were actually able to get a better picture of the correlation between bike and pet crashes and street like bike and pet index. And so looking at this graph, you can see pet and bike activity is fairly low at these intersections over here. And then once we start getting into the top 20% of intersections for bicycle and pedestrian activity, that's when we actually start seeing bike and pet related crashes starting to increase gradually until we get further up into the very top here. These were all the different intersection characteristics that we were to say, yeah, there probably is at least some sort of risk, increased risk at those intersections when, when these characteristics are present. And so you could see the street light index was on there, transit stops, bikeways, um, parks, schools, 
a whole slew of things that we're able to say, you know, we have the data for this and the data is showing that there is an increased risk here. And the um, street like index helped us kind of distinguish those things too. This is actually a really interesting graph that I have here. On the horizontal axis, you can see is the risk score of intersections. And so we have 3,000 intersections on, on this graph. Each dot, uh, there's a lot of them that are overlaying on each other. And then on the left side of the graph, the vertical axis is the number of crashes at those at each individual intersection. And so you can see that on the right side of the graph, we have a large concentration of dots that have higher streetlight index indices on here. And then we can also see that um, sometimes we had a risk score that was a little bit lower, but we're still having a lot of crashes at those particular intersections. And one of the things about those outliers is you can see that those particular intersections ended up having a higher um, streetlight index at them. So there were, was more pen and bike activity there. So, you know, there may just be a lot of um, crashes happening at the intersection strictly because there's a lot of activity there and there may not be that many other characteristics or there's a characteristic out there that we still just don't know of or have good data for that we may need to do a little bit of further investigation. So that's an, uh, another piece that we may look into. Looking at the future of pedestrian and bicycle planning at MnDOT and the opportunities for streetlight to be in our processes, we actually, I actually have another group at MnDOT, um, a partnership between MnDOT and University of Minnesota, where they're looking at mobile-based applications, um, including streetlight and other big data sources such as Strava, in order to get a uh, mobile sourced flow data to help improve and eventually create a pedestrian and bicyclist AADT map for the full state of Minnesota. This will be an interactive online tool that we'll be able to use to click on any particular road within the state and say, um, this is the estimated volume for pedestrians and the estimated volume for bicyclists. And so we're really looking forward to that particular project.